Welcome to the Dr. Gundry Podcast. You know, people are always asking me for recommendations on how to live longer, healthier lives. One thing that can dramatically boost your health span and even your lifespan, because one thing that can dramatically boost your health span and even your lifespan is something called a five-day vegan fast. In fact, this simple technique is like taking your mitochondria on a five-day spa retreat. And my guest today is one of the biggest proponents of this type of fasting, mimicking diets, Dr. Joseph Antun. He's the CEO of El Nutra and works hand-in-hand -hand closely with my good friend, Dr. Walter Longo, who many of you have read about in my books, and we've even had him on our podcast. This focuses on providing people with the knowledge and products to live to, oh, 110 and beyond. So on today's episode, Dr. Anton and I are going to talk about shifting away from sick care, how a fasting mimicking diet can help you live your longest, fullest life, and why most of the foods we're eating these days are actually less nutritious than they used to be. Uh, Dr. Anton, it's good to see you again. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you for hosting me, and I look forward for uh, a great session. I think uh, the audience will learn a lot today about fasting and, and improving their healthy aging. Yeah, I'm really, I'm really excited about this. Uh, as you know, I've been a big fan of, of your guys' work from, from, from the beginning. So, uh, yeah, you're, you've got a big fan here. So, let's start with your background. So, when did you first realize that our healthcare system in the United States was actually a sick care system? Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a physician by training. That was my first degree before uh, I, I went and specialized in health policy and public health. And exactly the reason why you're, uh, you know, learning about the sick care system. So actually during my rotations, you know, I started seeing patients and as a medical student trying to learn about how to practice medicine, and I was starting to be fascinated with this, how come the first time I interact with an individual is when the individual has already a symptom or is already sick. I was like, we did even better for our cars. You know, we did insurance for every car. We check them once a year. We have a dashboard that tells us, you know, the temperature is increasing or not before the smoke is, is, is getting out of the engine. So I was fascinated that we were just, the starting point of our action was a symptom and a disease. And then number two, the other fascinating thing is like I felt we're not solving the biggest diseases. So if a patient presents with diabetes uh, or cardiovascular issues, say blood pressure, et cetera, I would sit next to the, the attending or the, you know, the primary uh, doctor and just witness uh, a five, four, five pill prescription that each will just balance what the patient has in his blood, but it doesn't solve the main issue. It's just... Uh, um, so you give a, a pill for blood sugar, you move the, the sugar from the blood to the cells, and then, and then they get transformed into fat, and then more insulin resistance, and then you advance in diabetes instead of going backwards. Same thing for blood pressure, et cetera. And I felt we're not solving the issue. This, this patient sitting next to us, he gained weight fast. He was stressed. He's not exercising any longer. He's probably a little bit older and, um, and not sleeping well and maybe going through financial issues or stress at home or just change the lifestyle, eating less nutritious food, that, that's the solution. It was lifestyle medicine probably is the solution for many of the uh, chronic diseases we're trying to treat. So I felt we're not touching on those and definitely getting the patient out with five pills that will not get him to a solution. I, was, I would have been fine if we are reversing the diseases with that, but it wasn't even a solution. It was a prescription for life. And I didn't want to subscribe for that. I wanted to, I went to medical school to help patients and 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 help them you know find solutions and mostly wanted to help people not to get sick so uh, once i graduated i didn't do residency i decided to change healthcare systems around the world so i went and i did my studies in in health policy in harvard and i did public health at hopkins and launched a career looking uh, my to, to achieve my my passion which was moving the sick care system to a healthcare system there's always a place for sick care we ultimately will get sick, but it should be 10, 20% of the healthcare system. And most of the healthcare system should work on keeping us healthier longer rather than sick long. And, 
and that's the golden goose. And and today, if you ask most people, do you wanna do you wanna live long? Most people will tell you no because they remember the sick grandma who's suffering longer. Uh, now you turn the question a little bit: Do you want to live healthier longer? And then everyone says yes. And I think that's the most important thing that we haven't figured out today. Uh, unfortunately, we crossed 2.3 trillion dollars expenditure in healthcare in the U.S., and we just lost 0.4 years on our longevity in the U.S. Uh, people don't realize that spending more, doing more, and the the, the result is actually getting less. Uh, we just lost 0.4 years on our longevity as Americans. Yeah, and it's uh, you know three years in a row we've uh, decreased our longevity. Um, yeah, and. Uh, so why, okay, so you and I know this, you've spent your career you know, trying, fighting against this. What sort of incentives keep our healthcare system from changing to this model? There, well, there are m multiple, right? I mean, what we're saying makes sense and you would wonder always why the healthcare system does not focus more on, on prevention. And, and there are actually four or five major factors. Um, number one is, People, you know, we, we as humans, we like the short-term results. So when you look at policymaking and what we pay for every year, you know, we, we, paying for longevity is waiting for an unknown results in the next multiple years. So the entire healthcare system, it has to first take care of the sick people and is reactive to that. And then you go from policy to all the way to elections as well, because you don't want to, you don't want to put most of your budget in prevention and helping people not get sick, which they will never feel what the benefit was because they just, it's not tangible. So it starts with a system that has to take care of the short term and focus on, on, on supporting sick care first. Second is, there's no true market in prevention. The prevention today is a set of advisors, not a set of products. And this is why I ended up joining Anutra and work on the Fasting Mimic Night. I felt it was an anchor product to for the, for the prevention, but we'll go back to this afterwards. It just, and I've consulted with many ministers of health around the world and they know they need to put more money in prevention, but what, what does that mean? Um, people know they should not smoke and some people opt to do that, some people not. People know that they should eat healthy. Some people do, some people. So they, it just, it was never created in a market like we've done with sick care, where you have a hospital, a location where you deliver care, you have uh, uh, pills to solve as a product to consume. You have regulations. You have investments, etc. When you look at prevention, there is no uh, clinics that are specialized just in prevention. I mean, functional medicine is evolving there, which is a good thing, but it's not still a fully established, you know, uh, a full establishment. We don't have products that I can give to you today so that you stay healthy longer. There are theories about what to eat, etc. So that is the other, that's the other angle to it. Number three, which is as important probably, um, you know, we as humans, we respond a lot to financial incentives. And as long as we're not incentivized to do healthy things every day and, and, and made that easy for us, we're not going to adopt it. So, and, and this is for every day. If it's difficult to access a, a, a running track, if it's difficult to get to the gym, if it's always much cheaper to buy a, a, a burger meal for my kids versus you know, buying a, a healthy organic salad uh, from a, a you know higher end store. So uh, we build a society where it's difficult every day to be healthy and it's cheaper to be unhealthy. And that's very important. And we, we did try to advocate for, you know, some taxes on, on healthy food so that we at least cross subsidize healthy food to make it cheaper for the poor, especially. And unfortunately, there's a there's a reverse correlation between being poor and healthy. And, and this is if you want to move really the healthcare system, you need to support people with means and financial incentives to, to be able to access healthy, uh, uh, healthy lifestyles. So I think that's, that's a very important uh, uh, reason as well. So um, I took it upon me and a few around me with a lot of passion and, and, and you're one of those to go and create a market, create uh, uh, a strong evidence-based, science-based market for prevention and, uh, and trying to make it um, healthier and easier and penetrate medicine also with this concept of healthcare and prevention so that doctors don't just start seeing people after they're sick, but actually they start taking care of us on a longitudinal basis. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you uh, completely about uh, we've got it all wrong. A number of years ago, I was approached uh, by, uh, uh, by some manufacturers in a major Midwestern city 
uh, that had a medical school in that town and very good healthcare system. And they uh, wanted me to come in and design a program for their employees to teach their employees how to eat. And I, and I said, well, look, you know, you've, you've got a great medical school. You've got a lot of Nobel Prize winners there. You've got a great hospital system. You know, why don't you start there? You don't need me. And they said, oh, we did. You know, we, we met with all these guys. And they said, are you crazy? You know, we may say we're a health care system. We're a sick care system. And if we made your employees healthy, we'd be out of business. And I mean, this, yes. this is this is a true story. And I went, yes, there. Yeah, there is no in, there's no incentive for health. I agree. And if 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 you think about it, nobody makes money if we're healthy. Uh, a physician doesn't make money and, and a hospital doesn't make money. A, you know, a, a, a company selling a device or a pill. So in the U.S., with a system that we built starting from the private sector, a for-profit private sector, the incentive is really to consume rather than to, to not consume. But the advantage of it is that you would optimize delivery of care. This is why we're the number one in the world on delivery of care. We're, not, we're very far behind on prevention. And it also stimulates innovation, which is the backbone of why the U.S. is the leading force in, uh, in innovation. It's just driven by really great you know, for-profit opportunity and dream if you discover something in healthcare at the same time that system makes money and thrives when people are sick not when they're healthy so why haven't health insurance companies or even the government uh, you see these commercials on tv that you've got a safe driver app on your on your car and look i'm saving money you know shut up or safe drivers save 40 percent and these get memes on TV. So why wouldn't insurers and the government pay for safe eating practices? Because, um, you know, they were up until recently, they were able to transfer this accrued extra expenses to the, as premiums to the consumer and to the, the policyholder up until the last 10 years, 15 years, the, 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 the policy always saying is it's outrageous how much I'm paying for health care. They're putting the financial pressure back on the insurance. And now for the first time, the insurers are really looking into how can I save money the most? They first, in the, in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, they were saving money by revising cases, by still, still trying to do the best out of sick people. How can I revise my cases? How can I optimize my codes, my billing? But it was never prevention. And now, because of the pressures on not just the, the, the private insurance, but on Medicare and Medicaid, we see this in the last decade, a big wave of, okay, we need to do more. Let's look at lifestyle medicine. Again, lifestyle medicine wasn't fully ready as well. What they're going to, the insurance, what they're going to pay for, pay for telling you to eat healthy, you know that, telling you not to smoke, you know that. And it all goes back to give us a prevention market where there are products, regulations, investment, um, ad adoption from FDA, from the governments for reimbursement, then they will come into it. And this is what we're trying to build uh, 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 for, for insurance. And, and actually, they're talking to us on multiple levels, and I think that's going to be the future, is uh, if you have enough evidence-based proof behind something you're putting as a solution for prevention, I think that's going to be the future of medicine. So I mentioned in the introduction that many of the foods that we eat are less nutritious than they used to be. Uh, can you explain what's going on with that? Um, again, nutrition has been um, mainly a business rather than uh, rather than a medicine, right? We we are pushing for food as medicine. Unfortunately, for the last decades, it was mostly uh, food was a business, and in business, you try to give. You try to increase your margin, so you want to give a little bit the cheaper food, and cheaper food means starches, meaning means glucose, means uh, you know less nutritious food versus the more nutritious food of, and and also means collect the fruits and the vegetables when they're still green, store them in the refrigerator, they mature just in, in without without being on on the mother tree, and then spray them with pesticides and herbicides, and a little bit play with the. Uh, mix the mix the grains so that you get a higher gluten and a faster yield, and this is what business has meant versus what we should eat, which is definitely 
a lower gluten and more a fruit and a vegetable that is that are grown without pesticides and that are grown on the tree and the grass up until they mature. And this is why we lost the smell and the taste of fruits actually in the U.S. Um, and, and what we should do is consume more colorful, uh, we say eat the rainbow fruits and, and vegetables and go for more of the nutrients, uh, the vitamins, the minerals, and less for the sugar, less for the artificial changes we've imposed on food. And, and definitely even uh, there's a bigger story on fat as well, right? We, instead of having the, the, the several, several times fried oil and, and, um, and, uh, and some kinds of trans fat, it's really to focus on um, olive oil and, 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 and fish oil and, and everything that has high omegas and uh, even the nuts, um, you know, um, again, going back business versus not the, the healthy oil sources are expensive. So you don't see a lot of food based on macadamia and cashews. You see them based on, you know, peanuts and, 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 and fried French fries, uh, uh, source of oil, etc. So that's, that's unfortunately a big uh, change that happened to us. We as humans, most of our life we grew, you know, we needed water. It was the most vital thing that we needed. So we grew around rivers. Um, and, um, and this is where not just needed water to drink it, but also this is where there's green grass, there were fruits, there were trees, and there was food. And we were eating a plant-based diet mainly. And because fish doesn't, doesn't fly, doesn't run fast, doesn't see us, it was easy to fish. So we were mainly vegan with eating fish from time to time, what we call a pescatarian diet. With time, we evolved to hunt a little bit more, so adding a little bit of meat to it. But uh, this is what I would qualify more as Mediterranean diet. And this is what we should go back to, uh, rather than the fast deliveries at home today that's given us a lot more of the, the carbs and, and unhe- unhealthy fast versus, uh, fats versus uh, um, the, the nutrient-dense uh, fruits and vegetables. So, uh, you know, I got to, to know you guys um, because of, of your research in, you know, uh, the fasting mimicking diet. So there's a lot of different types of fasting and calorie restriction and every, everybody's confused. Yeah. So yeah. C- take us through what's the difference between Oh, water fasting, intermittent fasting, time-restricted eating, and a fasting-mimicking diet. Holy cow, I'm, yes. now, I'm even <laughs> confused now. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, we, we started publishing about fasting some four or five years ago, and the field picked up so big, and it's now actually the number one diet in the U.S., uh, two years in a row. Um, this year, clean eating kind of trumped it a little bit, but um, the diet that's being observed the most today in the U.S. is, is one, one of the kinds of fasting, which we're going to explain uh, uh, today. And, and I'm going to start with, you know, on the first typology, you have what we call intermittent fasting versus prolonged fasting. So this is the first thing people need to know. Intermittent fasting is fasting from a few hours up to two days. And then prolonged fasting is when you cross, you go a little bit beyond two days. There used to be a tiny category called short-term fast, two to three days, but now we're trying to simplify it and just say zero to two days, you're doing intermittent fasting, two days and beyond, you're doing a prolonged fast. And the main separation is really once you cross two days, the stress of fasting to the body is now you know, superior and therefore the body reacts differently. On the first two days, you can survive off burning your fat and using the liver as credit as a, for neoglucogenesis. When you cross that, the stress is so big that now there's cellular action. We're going to talk about that with prolonged fasting. But just for people to keep in mind is when you cross the second day, there's something called autophagy and the cells tries to rejuvenate to survive. And we're going to talk about that. Um, So let's start with intermittent fasting. Intermittent fasting, a few hours to two days. Most people fast within one day. They try to prolong a little bit the period, the overnight fast. So when we sleep, we're fasting, right? We're not eating. Uh, I hope so. Actually, a lot of us do eat uh, overnight, but when you're when you're sleeping, you're fasting, and uh, a lot of people are trying to stay for 12 hours without food or extend it to 16 hours. So within the same day, what you t- what you call intermittent fasting is the same concept as the flip side of time restricted eating. A lot of people hear that word, and uh, 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 Sachin Panda actually is one of the main researchers there. 
is the more you extend the overnight fast, the more you're restricting the period of food intakes. We call it time-restricted eating. So if you're fasting for 16 hours, then your time, restrict, your time that you restrict your food is for eight hours and vice versa. If you're, um, if you're fasting, say, for 12 hours, it means you're doing a time-restricted eating of 12 hours. So within the same, when you talk within the same day, intermittent fasting and time-restricted eating are just the, the, the flip side of the same coin. Now, why it's becoming very popular to do intermittent fasting is, is part of what we're talking about is us as human changing our lifestyle and behavior. Um, historically, you know, we used to uh, eat, you know, so the family would sit, eat at 6, 7 p.m., the sun would, would be down and we would sleep. There was no refrigeration, there's no TV, there's no Netflix at home. And then we wake up the second day and we eat again in the morning and this is your 12-hour a fast, which turns out to be very critical for our healthy aging, um, because if you eat f more frequently, if you eat over 18 hours, say, what's happening is most of the part of the day, your body is ingesting food, and when you eat carbs and protein, you have the growth factor increase, insulin and insulin-like growth factor, so you're in more an anabolic state. You're always, biologically, you're pushed to age faster, and you're stocking the extra calories in fat. So you're in fat building. It's like putting money in your account all the time. Your bank account will grow. So it's same, same the fat, same, same as fat. What you want to do? You want to balance how much you put in the bank and then allow time to spend it before you put again, uh, you put the money again. And I think that's key is to do at least 12 hours of fast, what we call the circadian fasting, meaning following the day and night, uh, the, the day and night cycle. Which you know, in 2017, the Nobel Prize in Medicine was on the biological clock of the organs. Even the organs we discovered, they actually need that rhythm. They need to work for a certain period and then rest for other periods. The same way we sleep to rest our brain, every organ was functioning. And we have that biological clock again, uh, won the Nobel Prize in 2017. So we are big proponents of what we call the circadian uh, fasting or the 12 hours of fast. Now, a lot of physicians in practice which may, most of them treat uh, diabetes or, uh, or obesity or you know, primary care, they're proponents of a little bit extending the overnight fast all the way to 16 hours, what we call the 16-8 intermittent fasting. And they do it because their patients need to lose weight fast and need to correct the metabolic you know, issue. And this is when it's worth going up to 16 hours without the food to just accelerate a little bit this weight loss and reverse the metabolic issue. And this is called 16 8, 16 hours fasting, eight hours of time restricted eating, and it's becoming very, very popular. There's a little bit of caution here that I would I would tell people about is that 16 8, or some people go to 18 hours or 20 hours, went from the clinics all the way to the general public. Um, but most people, if they're not really overweight or they have a short term, you know, uh, uh, health condition that they they're trying to fast for. They don't need to go all the way to 16 and 18 and 20 hours. And your body tells you that. You start feeling a headache. You start feeling weak. And actually, you do lose the weight when you, ex when you extend the fast because your body needs calories and your brain, first and foremost, is, 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 uh, is operating at peak in the morning. Your, your cardiovascular, uh, you know, the heart needs to, to pump your muscles. You're going to work. You're the most active in the morning. So this is why you lose the weight if you skip that breakfast, but at the same time, you're stressing your vital organs. So we're more of a proponent of do 12 hours only if you're healthy and fit. And then if you need to extend it a little bit for short-term reasons, probably that's a good thing to do on the short term. Now, there's been a number of publications, some of them recent, about the, the Ramadan fast. Um, so there's a 12-hour a window of not eating. You eat before yes. the sun comes up. You don't even drink during the day. And then you eat yeah. again when the sun goes down. And there's some actually dramatic uh, health changes, including, as you probably know, uh, turning off oncogenes uh, with that method. So uh, what, do you, what do you think about the Ramadan fast as a, as a health? Well, uh, we want to clarify the Ramadan fast is follows the 12 hours, which what we're talking about, but is is it concept coming from, meaning practice 12 with with the old type of religion, the orthodox type, the, the, in, the, in the recent days we're feasting in the, in the 12 remaining hours. So within the context of the true meaning of fasting for 12 hours, this is something exactly what we're talking about. And it, it does actually, um, there's, a, there's another big article, I recommend people read it in Gemma Oncology, 
um, and it talks about breast cancer, even not just prevention, but also women with breast cancer. They, I think they were looking at the uh, nurse health study, and they, they looked at women with breast cancer who fasted less than 13 hours versus more than 13 hours. There was even a difference in recurrence of the, of the cancer, which, which makes sense. You know, the less you eat, uh, the less you're pushing your body to grow. And when the body biologically ages, it gets more prone to diseases. And also you're less pushing your extra calories to go to into fat and therefore insulin resistance, which is one of the mothers of many diseases. We traditionally, people think carb is, is diabetes. It's not just carb, it's food in general, proteins and carb both push in both direction, cancer and diabetes. So Definitely, we are meant to eat, then absorb, then spend, then eat again. What happened to us today, and that's, that's, the, that's the fasting or the time restricted eating, what's happening to us today, most Americans eat within the 18 hours time frame. So we eat, 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 and rest a little bit. So we're always adding to the bank account. The bank account is increasing. Unfortunately, this is not fin- financially you want it to increase, but on a, on a health and health-wise, uh, you don't want the fat to increase, your reserves to increase, and this is leading to diseases in multiple multiple directions, not just diabetes, but cancer, Alzheimer's, and cardiovascular disease. That, that, that was intermittent fasting, if you want. If, if uh, you know, the, the, we clarified that intermittent fasting and time-restricted eating are the same within one day. Intermittent fasting is up to two days. And it's the period of where your body says, you know what, I have enough fat, and, and if I need some credit, uh, I'll take it from the liver, but I'm I'm okay. Two days, you know, I'll, I'll lose a little bit of weight. That's fine. And it becomes a little bit more stressful when you cross the second day. Again, it's not prescriptive for some people, day and a half or people two and a half days, but just uh, for the sake of typology, we talk about second day. Now you're going where, hmm, I did spend my bank account, right? So say you're the CEO of a company and suddenly you don't have Revenues, you can hold, you can help, you know, hold it for a month or two, and you can tap into your bank account and apply for a credit. But then, when the bank account is going down, you're going to have to come back to your company and restructure it. You're going to have to to be more cost effective in the way you do things. And the body does the same thing after day two. It comes to the cells and say, "Hey, I cannot nourish you any longer from the outside. You have to look inside for sources of calories, organelles, debris, uh, you know, some some damage that you can fix." what we call cellular rejuvenation, or in a more scientific way, we call it autophagy or self-eat. What autophagy means, self-eat. So the cell tries to live on its intracellular calories and optimize its, um, its operation. It's, uh, we call it restructuring in a, in, a financial, in a financial world or the corporate world, which is, hey, let's try to do the best out of what we have. That's important because now you're talking biologically. So intermittent fasting works on weight, and certain little bit metabolic improvement just because it's two days. Now, when you cross two days, you're talking more weight loss. You're talking more metabolic changes in cholesterol, triglyceride, inflammation, et cetera. But you're adding now the cellular improvement as well. So once you touch prolonged fasting, you're impacting all these three big uh, uh, important healthy aging metrics. Your weight, which you would lose really fast, the, 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 the excess weight, you're impacting your metabolic uh, uh, markers, cholesterol, triglyceride, HbA1c, etc., and then you're impacting as well a cellular or a biological change within the cell, and all of those contributing to healthy aging. And this is what made fasting, if you want, uh, a big, a big theory and a big thing to observe in the last three, four years, and a big topic talked about. I want to add one thing, which is it is a natural thing. It's important because. Every decade, we have a craze about a diet. You know, one day it's the Atkins, the other day it's the keto, the third day is the paleo. And these are human-made diets, which they have certain value, but certain disadvantages. I think the best thing you can do for your life, and, 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 and you mentioned this in your book, is to rematch us with what we're supposed to eat, which is a plant-based mainly solution with some intermittent fasting and two to three times per year do the prolonged fast in order to improve the cells and, and rejuvenate the cells. And I think rematching our body with what we were meant to eat is the diet is not going to be a fad, but it's going to be here to stay. And part of it is fasting. All right. So people are listening to this and they're going, oh, come on now. Um, there's no way I'm going to not eat anything for, for three days. Come on. Uh, I got to yeah. go to work. I got to get the kids to school. They're yes. driving me crazy. Uh, and you, you hear this and you know this, 
So take me to, you know, how did you guys get this crazy idea of designing a plant-based diet that mimics fasting? Yes. So um, you're right. And, you know, we, um, we as a neutral, the company that I'm currently the CEO of, we're a spinoff from University of Southern California. And USC has a longevity institute, which is probably the, the, uh, the, the leading institute in the world looking into fasting. And like you said, initially, we we're just doing water fasting. And when we proved the value of water fast in flea and, 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 and worms, and then went to mice, and then we went to human trial. And this is where we got the surprise. Obviously, like you're saying, most people in a clinical trial, in a human trial, they don't want to fast for three or four or five days, right? And and we like a little bit more than four to five days because you want to at least a couple of days of cellular rejuvenation. So people couldn't fast in to, from four to five days. And uh, the National Institute of Health and the National Cancer Institute were you know very generous into supporting USC in developing the fasting mimicking diet, meaning they're saying we're seeing really great mice data. We want you to do the human data, and we understand it's not safe or compliant. You know, we talk a lot about the positives about fasting. There are negatives about fasting. You know, when you stay for four days without food, you literally or or water or minerals or vitamin. It's not a it's not a joke. It's it's spending four or five days without very important nutrients, whether it's macro or micronutrients for the body. So uh, there's some risk doing that, and people obviously will not comply. They feel hungry and they get headaches and fatigues. So they were, the, the NIH was kind enough to sponsor the research to develop what we call the fasting mimicking diet, meaning can we nourish this body with ingredients while keeping at the cellular level the stress at the cell? So can we keep the stress of fasting on the cell so that the cell rejuvenates? And can we not uh, increase the blood sugar and increase, therefore, insulin? Can we not increase proteins and increase the signal of insulin-like growth factors, so that the body is not realizing it's eating. It is being nourished, but it doesn't realize it. The sensors are not triggered. So uh, to simplify it is, you know, if you're the CEO of a company and you need a million dollars to operate the company, if if we give you 200,000, are you going to feel fully satisfied that you're going to just not restructure? No, you're going to still feel that stress. And it's a little bit more complicated. The, the, the fasting mimicking diet, actually, we were able to not mimic fasting by starvation, and this is what took 12 years of research and over $36 million in, in funding, we were able to make fasting by nourishment. And that was very important. So we started looking at the cell, how the cell digests its protein, how the cell digests its carbs, what are the pathways, and how much can we give of every ingredient. Now we're beyond 75 ingredients. It's a nutrient-rich diet. And we're beyond 75 ingredients that the body and the cells get, each one at the level that the cell does not feel it's satisfied enough. And this is how we created the fasting mimicking diet. It's a plant-based diet. Um, it has very healthy, good fats uh, coming mainly from macadamia and, and other nuts. Um, again, which historically nutrition company didn't want to sell. They're the most expensive. And then uh, it's made of uh, fiber-rich, you know, source of carbs and, and has plant-based proteins. And every sequence is studied to actually get into your body, nourishes the cell without convincing the cell that there is food. And uh, it was an amazing discovery. To me, it's probably the biggest discovery in nutrition uh, for the last, you know, uh, years and years. And now we're in 18 clinical trials trying to see what are the benefits of a fasting when we can diet on different, on different conditions. And we're excited to see some of the early results uh, starting to get out there. Are you able to give us uh, a taste of what those clinical trials are showing? So... Uh, we, uh, we actually have, out of the 18 trials, probably we have eight on cancer. We have uh, two, two trials on diabetes, a few on cardiovascular and autoimmune diseases. Um, we cannot today, without really uh, uh, getting the results, really you know, uh, mention or position the diet for any of those. But in, um, in mice, there was a lot of promising data on showing, for example, if you, and this is an important concept, I think, moving forward, part of, we're talking about changing healthcare is, you know, cancer patients historically, we gave them chemotherapy or hormone therapy and more recently immune therapy and, and CAR-T, et cetera, but we've never looked at their diet in a serious way. And that's very important because cancer, cancer is a cell 
that lost its inhibition keeps replicating without without stopping. This is why it grows fast and then spreads around you know the body. So how come we never thought about slowing the growth of cancer, not just by chemo, but by food, right? If a, if a cell has to grow fast, it needs food. And without food, it's going to grow slower. And probably this is how we talked about the GEM oncology paper of overnight fasting. Probably what's happening when every night you're fasting and you're prolonging it a little bit is you're underfeeding your breast cancer, and therefore it cannot, it cannot grow as fast as, as it would like to, to grow. What we've observed in mice with a fasting mimicking diet is because we're going on a solid, you know, three, four days of fasting. And in humans, we do four days uh, and then we add one day of refeeding. But now you really, really starve this cancer over four days. And we do it right before chemotherapy. So chemotherapy comes on day five, on day four. Um, so you got a good three days of fast. Day four is fasting as well. And chemo comes on day four. The cancer is so much sensitized to the chemotherapy that in mice we showed tremendous um, data on uh, on significant data on uh, slowing down the growth of the tumor. And in humans, we're about to publish on the same topic as well. And the concept is, as I said, you want to starve the cancer um, and you want to then have the chemo coming on a very weakened cancer and hopefully kill more cells. So I think this is an important point. Um, you're not anti-chemotherapy. Um, you're saying here's an uh, you know, additional way to maximize the effect of chemotherapy. Yeah, uh, and, and I'm, I'm not against any medicine actually. I just am against the concept that medicine, that pills are the only solution. And I'm against the concept of the best thing we as brilliant minds have provided is, hey, we'll wait for you to be sick and they will give you something that's not going to solve your disease again, it's just going to keep you sick. And even there, it's, you're not going to live longer, you're going to live shorter. So now it's like, it's not the worst case because we're losing a little bit of under longevity. And with the concept of, okay, if you get sick, and most of us, if not all of us, will have a chronic disease. And um, how can we first not have you get sick, sick early in your life? You know, why, why we're, uh, we should get the first cancer at age 50 or the first diabetes diagnosed at age 50, why not push those at 70 and 80? And then when you get sick, it should be, we should do something a little bit more than just uh, just a pill. If you think about it, you know, today, most of us either don't take anything per day or say one or two pills. Food, you take it three or four times per day. So it could be the biggest pill or the biggest poison that you put in your body. We're made of food that we eat and we eat every day. So it's it's the same. It's the one thing that we put in our body multiple times. How come we have never thought about it as being one of the most powerful intervention for our prevention, but also when we're sick? And this is where we come. Uh, we're called Anutra Nutrition for Longevity, and we focus on how nutrition can impact our health span and healthy aging when we're healthy, and how can we tailor nutrition for different health conditions to to support the patient. Uh, with better management. We're not here to be against uh, uh, the pills, and actually we're here to empower uh, the um, the existing ways of the standard way of doing medicine, which is very valid and has gone through a lot of evidence-based validation. Uh, um, we're here to empower it. We're here to tell the healthcare system it's about medicines, but it's about food. It's about, it's about exercise. It's about stress. It's about sleep. It's about feeling happy and giving and receiving love all these factors are going to impact uh, the outcome of, uh, of a health condition and, and healthy aging. So speaking of uh, healthy aging and even longevity, since longevity is kind of in your title of El Nutra, um, as you and I know, calorie restriction has been the, the only way to extend good lifespan. And there's some debate in primates. So one of the primate studies showed it did. The other primate study showed it didn't. You and I, I think, both agree why those two studies are different. Uh, I think it was the selection of foods in those two studies. But um, calorie restriction legitimately will never get adapted by the vast majority of human beings because, like you say, people want to be happy and. I do have some CR patients, and I would not describe them as generally happy people. Uh, <laughs> is that that's being kind, I guess? Um, yes. So, but your program, uh, tell us tell us about 
Prolong, and tell us about the food company that you guys now have. How, how does that fit, fit in, in into having us have a great lifespan? Yeah. So, you know, the, the, the research that I talked about on the fasting mimic diet before is in the clinical trial. Now you mentioned the, 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 the name of our first product, which is not positioned for disease, but it's positioned for healthy aging, as you mentioned. And the Prolon is the first uh, to market fasting mimicking diet. It's a five days box of food. You receive it, you can order it, you get it at home. Either, uh, you know, um, we have 11,500 clinics now registered to to recommend Prolon to their to their patients. And uh, and if you're healthy, you can take it three to four times a year to, again, optimize your weight, maintain a healthy level of uh, metabolic balance and, uh, and, and, and enhance cellular cleaning. Um, we, we have studied fasting and aging for the last 20 years, and the fasting we're making night is the culmination of what can we do today in, in society to help people, like you said, not be on an everyday change on their lifestyle, not impose a new lifestyle on them. And, and we nutrition tried that multiple times, and whether it's low calorie, whether it's the Atkins, people want to enjoy their food. And so how can we help them first enjoy healthy food? That's the first solution. Number two is intermittently, can we do some corrections to help them? And the fasting mimicking diet is like the story of every college. If you go to any college and you go into a class, you have 85 to 90% of the students, they don't study every day. They, uh, you know, they, they try to balance a little bit of study with a little bit of, uh, with a little bit of uh, school fun. And there's a good 10% of the class that really is very studious and studies every day. And these are the fit people in society. Now, the 85, 90%, they cannot study every day. They want to enjoy life. But what happens is five days before the exam, they do stress themselves. They, sit, they study you know, 18 hours, 20 hours a day, and they go and they pass the exam. The fasting mimicking night is kind of that. It's a superior level of stress. It's not a calorie restriction level of, hey, I lose weight with time. It's a true stress because fasting is the biggest stress you can impose on a cell. Every cell in your body needs calories. And when every cell feels a fasting mode, there's a transformation with the cells. So it's a higher level of stress. This is what the success of fasting is. The soup, the secret soup is the stress. Chronic calorie restriction is a little bit of drowning your bank account. When you stop giving money is when your CFO will call you and say, hey, like zero money is coming. Let's do something about it. And fasting is that higher stress, which we, when we were in college, a lot of people, you know, did this five days before the exam and you know, got by with an A minus, some a few times an A, and most times a B plus, and and I think this is one of the most practical solution for society today. Is we definitely recommend people eat healthier um, during the 25 days, but for five days a month, they can do the fasting mimic diet to clean the cells, adjust their weight, and maintain healthy level of metabolism. And you now, uh, rather than telling everybody to uh, the rest of those days have pizza and ice cream and spare ribs and hot dogs, you now have a, a food delivery company. Uh, where does that fit in all this? So when we launched Prolon, a lot of people, you know, seeing how much time we put in the science and evidence behind it and trusted the company when we delivered and by the way, for, for people, you know, hearing us today, this is not a, a, a project that is full for profit. Actually, we donate back 60%. Our founder, Professor Walter Longo, and I do recommend uh, you guys read a little bit more about him. Walter founded the concept of fasting and fasting, periodic fasting and fasting mimicking, and he donates all his shares back to, to foundation. So, um, so I do speak today about a product and what we have in it, a lot of pride because most of it is gets back donated. Um, so a lot of people believing in Prolon and doing it for five days, it changes their, one of the biggest advantages, they say, it changes my relationship with food. And I feel after this five days, I don't want to go back to my pizza and my pasta. What can I do to eat healthier or to eat healthy? And we used to recommend, you know, uh, a plant-based or, a, or a, vegetarian, a vegetarian or a pescatarian with, you know, a couple of times, three times a week, fish, pescatarian diet. And for some who really want to have some red meat, a Mediterranean diet would, uh, would be a recommendation. A lot of people's feedback to us was, you know, I don't understand the ratios, macros, macros, what to buy, how much to buy. And, and I don't trust any grocery or place to go to and make sure that my food has not been sprayed with pesticides, that the, that the soil has, doesn't contain herbicides, that 
the grains are not mixed, doesn't have gluten. I don't know if you saw the study, but 37% of restaurants that they say they have gluten-free food actually had gluten. Oh, yeah. So, um, so we decided to be the first company in history to go and own the entire supply chain of food, meaning... We went and, and longevity food specifically. So we went around the world. We brought seeds and grains from longevity zones where centenarian lives or people reaching 100 and beyond. And uh, we got that grain, old grains, hundreds and sometimes thousands of years old. So not genetically modified, not mixed. We brought it to the U.S. We took a first big land in West Side Jersey in Long Valley specifically, speaking about longevity. And then we, um, we seed them, we grow them, we harvest them, and we package them into what we call the longevity diet, vegetarian or pescatarian. And then we ship them um, anywhere in the U.S. within, uh, you know, second day delivery. So what we achieved is bringing the true grains and seeds. We are growing them with a guarantee. Why we wanted to grow them? Because we wanted to guarantee that there's no chemicals added to them. We even have fish in the soil, so we feed them the plants and we get their excretion back to the soil so that we're not bringing artificial fertilization. We practice regenerative farming. So it's one of kind of, it's like a thousand year old piece of plant earth that came back, that came back to today's time, very pure, very clean. And we package them in longevity uh, uh, packages and send them to uh, to any house around the US within the second day delivery. Yeah. Um, so that, that completes the circle of eat healthy, 25 days, do your prolong on five days to rejuvenate. Um, and, and I think it's a full nutritional solution for people. As they say, you've got it covered soup to nuts, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> that project is, you know, it's been great. It's called Nutrition for Longevity, yeah. It's been great. It's been great seeing you again and having you on the program. Now, okay, so how do people find out about you and Dr. Longo's work? Uh, where do we go? Uh, the best way to find about our mission in general is through the L-Nutra site, L-Nutra, this longevity through nutrition. And then if you want to learn more specific about Prolon, go to the Prolon site, P-R-O-L-O-N, and the food every day is healthy food is called Nutrition for Longevity. It's actually nutritionforlongevity.com. Dr. Walter Longo, um, he's all over the internet, and, uh, and he has his book, The Longevity Diet, which talks about what we talked about today. Um, and he has been, you know, Time Magazine named him about the top 50 most influential people in health. So anytime you Google his name, you're going to see a lot about that. And one of the purest uh, gentlemen who, I think one of the leaders in what we call this Nutritech space, bringing technology and bringing science to nutrition, spending decades of research to really proving something before it goes out to the market. And I think this is what makes this a really exciting journey. All right. Well, as, as my uh, listeners and my readers know, I, I definitely give a shout out to Dr. Longo whenever I can and really appreciate both of your work and what you guys are doing. And thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Uh, now more than ever, it's really important. Uh, yeah, thank you very, very much. And we'll see you soon, hopefully. Yeah, hopefully uh, we'll see you in person again soon. One of these days. Yes. Uh, <laughs> all right, take care. Thanks okay. again. Hey, bye-bye. Hey, bye. Thanks, thanks. Bye-bye. Okay, time for the audience question. Nita Bichel on Instagram asks, what should I eat to reduce arthritis pain in my knees and neck? Well, I got news for you. Uh, eat the plant paradox way and you will be amazed how your arthritis will lessen or go away. I used to have such bad arthritis in my knees, I wore braces to run and I don't have any arthritis anymore. And I have so many patients, that's one of the things they notice almost immediately when starting the program is their arthritis pain dramatically goes away. Great question. Okay, now it's time for the review of the week. Karma by Kim on iTunes writes, you make complex issues so easy to understand and you explain how we can apply them to our lives. It's refreshing and inspirational, and I no longer feel helpless in my own body. Well, thank, thanks a lot, Karma by Kim. That's actually why we do this. Um, I hope I have a great way of making this easy to understand, uh, and you just told me I do, and I'm gonna keep doing it. Uh, and thanks for giving us that feedback. So we'll see you next week, and please keep those uh, 
comments coming in. We read them. I love them. And we'll uh, hopefully read yours on the air soon. Bye-bye. Before you go, I just wanted to remind you that you can find the show on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Because I'm Dr. Gundry, and I'm always looking out for you. Mm-hmm.